Representative Rowe, if you could start us out by introducing yourself. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm David Rowe. I represent the 85th Legislative District. That includes Snyder, Union, Juniata, and Mifflin Counties. Good morning, everybody. Torn Ecker. I represent parts of Adams and Cumberland County in the south center part of the state. Representative Josh Kale, represent Beaver and Washington counties. Kristen Marcel, represent the 178th District. Everyone's here in my district, so I just wanted to welcome everyone quickly. And uh, my area is Wrightstown, most of Northampton, Upper Southampton, and Warwick Townships. Good morning, everyone. My name is Craig Stats. I represent the 145th Legislative District in Upper Bucks County. Uh, I have served on the House Education Committee for 10 years, and I currently chair the Career and Technical Education Subcommittee. Welcome. Good morning. I'm Shelby Labs. I represent the 143rd Legislative District, which is just about next door in Central and Upper Bucks County. Good morning. I am Representative Craig Williams from Delaware and Chester Counties. And Representative Casey Tomlinson, if you'd like to briefly introduce yourself. State Representative Casey Tomlinson, 18th District, Lower Bucks County. And Representative Eric Nelson is also joining us online. For all those joining us online, you know the drill. Press the raise button, and uh, we will call on you. If I don't recognize you, uh, please shoot me a text or shoot Dan a text. Representative Marcel, thank you for having us here in your beautiful district. Uh, if you'd like to give brief opening remarks, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. It's an absolute honor to welcome you to today's policy hearing in my district and to have the opportunity to showcase the incredible work that's being done by Middle Bucks Institute of Technology, Council Rock, and all of our local school districts. As a former school board director for both Council Rock and MBIT, I am pleased to have our administrators, school board representatives, and local businesses here today to share how they provide a great education to their students. Um, I'm sorry to share how they provide a great education to their students, helping to support our community's workforce and economy. More and more students are recognizing the value of pursuing careers in trade and technical fields. MBIT is doing remarkable work in training and preparing our students to be productive, successful members of our workforce, and I'm proud to support their mission. I want to extend my sincere thanks to MBIT for hosting us today. Your commitment to our students and community is deeply appreciated. Thank you very much, everyone, for being here. I look forward to the insights and discussions that we'll have today. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Marcel. And we've also been joined by Representative Hogan. Thank you for being here, Representative Hogan. You know, public education is uh, something that our caucus takes very serious. And over the course of the last couple of weeks, and really over the course of the last year and a half, we've been doing series on public education, uh, looking at school districts that have really been doing a good job, uh, looking at school districts that need particular types of help, and trying to form a policy agenda around uh, those that are doing things the right way and providing the best services for our kids. Because that's really what the whole process is all about is our students and getting the best for our students and I got to say it must have been about a year ago representative staffs and representative labs we did a hearing in upper bucks is that right and the tech school up there was phenomenal the school up there was very impressive I had one of my children with me and I'm looking forward to the hearing about what's going on here so today we have two uh, two panels our first panel uh, we have a total of six testifiers. The first panel will provide insight into what Council Rock School District is doing to provide a great education to their students while respecting the taxpayers. The second panel will provide insight into the value of Middle Bucks Institute of Technology and uh, the value that they're providing to their students and our future uh, workforce. Each testifier, if you could, uh, keep your testimony to three to five minutes. I've, I've never gaveled anybody out. But we do like to keep it uh, within three to five minutes because we want to ask questions and a lot of us uh, will have questions after and we, if we can open it up and have a conversation that also is helpful for us to, to get that information as well. Our first panel, uh, the Council Rock School District panel, we are going to have uh, Michael Roosevelt, a member of the Council Rock School Board, joining us here. Thank you for your service. The school board uh, is, is not the most... Uh, it's not the easiest job in the world. Uh, it's, it's certainly one that um, 
it always seems like any decision you make, somebody's upset at the school board level. So thank you for doing what you do. And also joining us is Dr. Andrew J. Sanko, the superintendent of Council Rock School District. Doctor, thank you for being here. Mr. Roosevelt, the floor is yours. Sorry about that. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me to testify today. Um, I appreciate this immensely. I want to thank all of you for coming here as well. Um, I want to thank your interest and your service on this panel of the House Republican Policy Committee uh, and obviously Representative Kristen Marcel for inviting me to testify today. It's an honor to serve Council Rock community and my constituents within the school district. Um, along with Northampton Township each day. I'm happy to share the great work we do for our students each day. I've been on the Council Rock School Board for almost three years and came into office at the tail end of the pandemic. When the board was faced with learning loss and how we could support our administration, students, community, and return to normalcy. Our board was fo focused on how to help students each and every day and each decision was tied exactly to how it would benefit students. This is why I was pleased when Dr. Sanko, when Dr. Sanko came on as superintendent, he was sitting next to me. He created a new motto for the district, students first always. That helps to unify us around the issues that's most important for Council Rock, the students. Thinking of students first is how our district decided to add a fifth special for elementary school the STEAM program, which I was happy to work with Kristen Marcel at the time on the board, when the board and along with the rest of the board. The high school science teachers came to the board and asked us to consider a STEAM special for elementary students because they wanted children to be exposed to concepts at a younger age. So by the time they reached high school, they'd be more prepared for the science curriculums that they would face. While Dr. Sanko can share more about the program and how it's implemented, I've heard very pos a lot of positive feedback from students who've benefited from the new special and some elementary students have shared this with their, now it's their favorite special. Another creative program that I'll briefly touch on since Dr. Sanko I expect will spend some more time delving into more details is the Knights for Knowledge program. As I mentioned earlier, I joined the board at the time when we were looking at ways to help the learning loss and the lower, the declining and lower test scores for many of our students. A lot of them were struggling with getting back to education, struggling with try to, how to move forward in, a, in the manner that they were previously accustomed to. And this is very similar to a lot of other areas in Pennsylvania dealing with the pandemic and how to learn in your bedroom away from your peers and away from your teacher just looking at a screen. So it was wonderful that we were able to use the ESSER funds that were provided to the district to create um, an evening tutoring program for math is where it started across the district to serve students who were struggling or just wanted more assistance. Dr. Sanko can speak more about the program's implementation and its cost. It was very successful, low cost program and had tremendous benefits to our students. Hearing a child come home and to their father and say that they enjoy school or they enjoyed that tutoring program, I think is probably the highest gauge that it was a success. Uh, but seeing their scores increase, it just puts the icing on the cake. Finally, I wanted to mention the Council Rock is in its second year of offering a senior property tax relief program that my board colleague Joe Hidalgo worked very hard on and I supported as well to get it started. We all know how difficult it is for seniors to pay property taxes in our area. I heard this a lot when I step out into the community or knock doors. They're very concerned about how they're going to continue to stay here. So this was a wonderful program as a start to assist them. The, the program is a property tax rebate on top of the one that the state provides, meaning that if a senior qualifies for the state property tax, they also qualify for the district po property tax. They receive this rebate on top of the one from Council Rock. Again, Dr. Sanko can share the details on how that program has been implemented and how it's going so far, but I know it's been popular program with our seniors. 
Again, I appreciate the opportunity to talk about the successful elements of Council Rock School. I'm proud that we're able to provide a strong education to our district students while also focusing on fiscal responsibility and using our taxpayers in a responsible way. Maintaining a predictable and consistent tax rate has also been a success. The Council Rock School District is provide below Act 1 and able to accomplish all of this with that, which I appreciate. So thanks once again for allowing me to testify, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you. Dr. Sanko. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Roosevelt. Good morning, distinguished members of the Policy Hearing Committee. My name is Dr. Andrew Day J. Sanko, preferably I go by Andy. I'm the superintendent of the Council Rock School District. Our district educates over 10,500 students each year in our 15 schools, encompassing 72 square miles of Bucks County. This September, I will begin my 36th year with Council Rock. My tenure as superintendent began in June 2022, and I'm honored to work within a dynamic community that values providing the finest education to each and every one of our students. I'd also like to thank Representative Kristen Marcel for the opportunity to share with you several successful initiatives that Council Rock has implemented. Initiatives that are reshaping the landscape of public education. Before I begin, however, let me frame these comments around the fact that our teaching and administrative staff, along with our school board, should be credited with the success of these initiatives. They are the originators of the ideas that underlie much of what you will hear about this morning. Their vision and shared commitment to the highest possible standards in educational practice makes these initiatives possible. In Council Rock, we live by the simple ethos, students first, always. Those three words capture the essence of the educational philosophy and guide our practice. Everything we do from our facilities department to the business office, to the classroom, to community outreach, is focused on putting the students first. In fact, our decisions as a district pivot around the question, what is in the best interest of our students? Today I'll share details about our Knights for Knowledge program, our STEAM elementary special, and our tax and rental rebate program. The two academic programs, Knights for Knowledge, and the STEAM special were designed to provide instructional opportunities to enhance student learning. The tax rebate program was reintroduced in conjunction with the Pennsylvania Department of Revenue to provide taxpayers some relief from property and rental taxes. These initiatives and many more undertaken by Council Rock strengthen our shared commitment to providing a strong educational foundation for our students as they prepare to eventually enter the larger world. As you likely know, the disruption of teaching and learning around the pandemic was felt in classrooms across the country. This interrupted learning created gaps in content knowledge, which is a critical element necessary for student progress. Whatever the cause, in the fall of 2021, teachers and parents observed the noticeable learning gap that was reflected in both classroom assessments as well as standardized test scores. While pundits sought to assign blame, Council Rock instead took action. The result was Knights for Knowledge, an innovative approach to providing remediation and support for students in grades three through eight. Knights for Knowledge kicked off in January 2023. The program was scheduled to last through the spring and focused specifically on reinforcing math skills. PSSA and Keystone review sessions were at it. Many students were recommended to participate in this program by their classroom teacher, and others joined the program by choice. No child was turned away from Knights for Knowledge, and the 275 students registered that year. Weekly classes were held in the early evening and taught by Council Rock staff. Details of curriculum, scheduling, and instruction were developed in-house, and both general education and special education best practices were employed. SAGE, the Senior Adults for Greater Education, offered to help students with practice and by, by facilitating small group work. Students from our advanced high school math classes also participated, supporting teachers and students where needed. 
The program was offered for students in grades three through six, grade nine and 10, and in year two, 491 students participated. <clears throat> the result was an effective, valuable experience for students that not only impacted their understanding of math, but also reinforced the content knowledge being taught in their regular classroom. In fact, teachers of Knights for Knowledge participants began to share that they noticed the difference in math confidence and equity among students who participated in the program. One unintentional but significant benefit was how generously the Council Rock community joined together to help support students. I'm not sure what had more impact, the learning or the sense of community that was fostered. In January 2024, Knights for Knowledge expanded to include literacy. Year two was even more successful, providing support to students in reading and math. We in Council Rock are proud that this homegrown initiative has been able to reach so many students and help them regain their strong footing in mathematics and literacy. In June 2022, when I was appointed superintendent, one of the priorities my administration tackled head on was adding a STEAM special to the elementary rotation. That year, our school board had wisely voted to add STEAM, science, technology, engineering, art, and math to the curriculum for students in grades one through six to begin in the fall of 2022. STEAM, because it borrows from so many diverse disciplines, is an opportunity for students to solve real world, pro real world problems using the engineering design process. One of the features of our program is that it is not a canned curriculum. That is, our STEAM curriculum has been crafted by our STEAM specialist and is unique to Council Rock. At present, STEAM is taught in our 10 elementary schools to more than 5,000 students. And beginning next fall, kindergarten students will include STEAM in their special rotations as well. Council Rock STEAM program is standards-based, aligning not only to math, science, and art standards, but also incorporating elements of Pennsylvania steel standards enacted in 2022. Our students have opportunities to learn coding, fabrication, digital design, and robotics. They use hardware such as Ozobots, Spheros, Kiva Planks, Finches, and Cubelets, and software such as FabMaker, Tinkercad, and Minecraft. They are encouraged to think cr critically, collaborate, be creative, and persevere in finding innovative ways to achieve challenges set before them. Most importantly, the STEAM classroom is naturally adapted to every learning style imaginable. STEAM is an academic playground where minds of younger students are free to build authentic knowledge that will serve them well in the economy of the future. What I find most compelling about our STEAM program is that it naturally aligns with the technology programs that our middle schools and high schools including MBIT. Our expectation is that in the coming years with students having been exposed to STEAM during the elementary years, our middle and high school students will have a greater problem solving capacity in all academic areas. We took a leap into the future with our STEAM program and we have not looked back. Finally, Council Rock has introduced the property tax and rent rebate program which gives qualifying taxpayers in the district relief in the form of a rebate. The program is based upon the existing Pennsylvania tax rebate program operated, operated by the Pennsylvania Department of Revenue. The program in Pennsylvania has been in effect since 1971 and is funded by state lottery and slot machine proceeds. It supports homeowners and, and renters across Pennsylvania by providing a rebate ranging from $380 to $1,000 eligible to older adults and people with disabilities age 18 and older. In order to qualify for the rebate, taxpayers must meet the criteria set forth by the Department of Revenue and com complete a state tax return. Needless to say, there is paperwork associated with applying for the rebate and many of our seniors need help navigating the application process. Fortunately, we've been able to partner with area legislative offices to help our citizens with their applications, answer questions, and make sure they have the necessary information entered correctly. Council Rock has conducted informal sessions for the community over the last two years where taxpayers can learn more about the program. Providing assistance for this program 
not only supports the senior population, but it also sends a message that Council Rock values all members of the school community. While these initiatives are highlights of Council Rock's success, they are but a small part of the tremendous effort we put forth each day in the best interest of our students. As the educational landscape continues to evolve, we hope to always be of service to our community, be responsive to the needs of our students and families, and to break new ground in academic excellence. I would also like to thank Dr. Chuck Lentz, who's the superintendent of the New Hope School, Salisbury School District, who's not able to be with us today. He's the superintendent of record of MBIT. He's on the administrative retreat with his administrators. And I would like to thank all of you for your time and for me allowing to share some of the ways Council Rock is transforming public education while staying true to the solemn promise to keep students first always. All right, Representative Marcel. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you to Mr. Roosevelt and Dr. Sanko for testifying today. I know Mr. Roosevelt has a plane to catch, and so whenever he needs to go, he should go. Um, but um, I wanted to thank you. Have a safe flight. Um, so, so Dr. Sanko, you're in the hot seat. No, I'm just kidding. Um, and so uh, I had a comment. One is that um, I think that the property tax and rent rebate program that Council Rock has been doing that Joe Hidalgo helped and all the other of my prior board colleagues helped to put together is just a remarkable thing. I hope that other districts across the Commonwealth consider doing something like that. Um, and I wanted to thank your office um, because we've done a lot of joint um, events and try because you know people usually need help from our office to get that first form filled out. And then it's nice to be able to pass them along to Council Rock so that they can get that second uh, rebate as part of the program. So I just wanted to thank you so much and thank the board for making that a priority because I know that seniors, um, you know, really, when, you know, when you're talking, they really have a problem with property taxes and affording them as they are on fixed incomes later in life. So I just wanted to thank you and thank the, the board for making that a priority. Um, and then my question is um, relating to the Knights for Knowledge program, which I'm aware of, obviously, from being on the board then. But um, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about the what you think are the results that you've seen from the program based on the costs that, you know, the district is paying money for this program, but are the results that you're seeing um, do you think it's worth that amount of money? Um, and then, obviously, you can't use ESSER funds forever. And so, um, you know, are there other also ideas that you may have for other districts of how they could potentially consider doing a program like that in the future? Um, you know, ideas for us, maybe a grant program or maybe some things that we could do looking at, um, you know, some of the education code in the future or things like that. So um, if you wouldn't mind sharing a little bit more about the costs and results and maybe give us some ideas for future legislation, that would be great. Sure. Thank you very much. So <clears throat> to your first um, comment about the tax rebate program, there are some other districts in Bucks County that participate, um, and we know based on the last two years' work, we expect a higher rate of participation this year than we had last year. Regarding Knights for Knowledge, as Mr. Roosevelt said, um, we paid for that for the last two years through ESSER funds. ESSER funds have come to an end at the end of the last school year. Um, so the cost on the first year, we, we built it in, and it, 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 it began somewhere after January. So we really had the second half of the school year. And we had a, a sharp focus on math, math aptitude, and math um, test scores. Uh, and the cost of that, when we ran that, we staffed it by hiring teachers within our district. And as you heard me say, we had uh, senior adult volunteers from our SAGE program that helped. They volunteered their time. And we had um, math students, high school math students. And the cost of that for that program in the first year was somewhere around $50,000 of ESSER funds that we expended doing that program. Um, we then wanted to grow it, uh, not just in math. We wanted to grow it by cr content area. So we added ELA, English and Language Arts, and we also wanted to grow the pool of students that could take advantage of it. In the first year, we did it grades three to eight, and then we expanded it. By expanding it from just math to language arts uh, and math, we doubled that cost. It cost us 
uh, six figures, around $100,000 of ESSER funds to do it. Um, part of the, the difficult part uh, was the logistics because we were asking people, parents, to drive their kids at 6 o'clock at night to a location, and we wanted to have ease of access for parents. Uh, another challenge was with that time, our elementary school day for teachers ends at 4 p.m. We started at 6 p.m., so the teachers that had a distance to travel, it was harder for them to, to come back and, and help. But we found benefit in, in it, both qualitative and quantitative benefit in the program. Uh, I think Mr. Roosevelt summed it up most precisely and the best by saying when a, when a child comes home and says that they like it or they learn something, uh, that's worth it. We did track, um, we did track data. Um, and again, because it's a voluntary program, students, some students attended every session, some only attended a few sessions. But we looked at it as an opportunity to hone skill set, the student skill set for math and language arts, prepare them for the work that they're doing in the classroom and review uh, and remediate the work that they've done in the classroom. And some of our students, many of our students had better outcomes in the classroom when it came time to the high stakes testing. Uh, like the PSSAs, as well as the regular testing that you would do in a, a fourth grade, a third grade um, math curriculum. We continued to look at Nights for Knowledge, um, and I have to credit the people within Council Rock for coming up with that creative name for tutoring. We continue to look at it to reframe it every year. We are out of funding for it uh, for this upcoming year, but we're looking at ways to build it and be able to attack different areas or different disciplines. And then um, if we can find that there's merit to that, offer it to a wider group of students and then figure out how we would, we would, we would pay for it. So we do believe there's merit in it. We have seen um, evidence through some of those test results, but I think the biggest, the biggest uh, wow factor for us administratively and educationally is the number of students who voluntarily participated. You know, over, over two years, we were somewhere around, you know, um, seven, 800 students, and that's in a subset of our 10,500. Thank you very much, Dr. Sanko. I appreciate it. I, my son participated last year, and it was great for him, and he looked forward to it. So, uh, so thank you very much. Thank you, Chairman. Vice Chairman Eckert. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you, Dr. Senko, for uh, holding down the fort here uh, uh, on, on the hot seat. Um, every we, we've done a lot of these education pause hearings over the last couple months, and every time I I talk about this, uh, right, I ask questions. I talk about how when we talk about education, we're at the end of the day we're talking about our students, right? And the fact that you guys, as part of your mission. Um, students first always, I think, is, is, is a remarkable thing that at your focus, the students are, are, are there. And, and, and listen, all educators believe that, but the fact that you as a mission, uh, as a school district, have said that out loud, I think, is, 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 is commendable, and I appreciate that. Um, I'm going to turn now to the property tax rebate program because I'm fascinated by this. I, I come from an area as well in South Central Pennsylvania where property taxes um, are something that are a pretty hot issue in, in our area. And uh, this is the time of year, obviously, where our offices hear a lot from, uh, from the elderly folks that get their tax bills, their school tax bills. Uh, so I'm, I'm fascinated by this program, program because I think it's an opportunity, maybe even locally for me, for my school districts. These policy hearings are always great where we can learn about what, what other areas of the state are doing something. I'm fascinated by this program. So I have a few questions so that I can go sell this to some of my school boards back home if possible. So uh, this is a newer program, it sounds like. Um, is when, when you guys were developing this or coming, coming about this, is how, how did you jive with the loss of revenue? How, how did you, you know, what, what is the loss of revenue uh, from those rebates? And, and how did you uh, come to that conclusion that, that the school district could handle this? Thank you for the question. So, so it was brought to us, again, as Mr. Roosevelt said, it was brought to us by another school board member, Mr. Hildago, Joe Hildago. 
and he asked us to to look into it and we went we did our homework um, our business office was really busy with this and we found that there was a way to do it uh, and offer this program and understood the qualifiers so there are certain conditions with regard to age uh, disability income that would predicate someone being eligible to apply for the Pennsylvania rebate which is mandatory to have complete it before you can take advantage of the Council Rock School District rebate. Um, because there is a, an income limit, uh, we don't know what all of our, our community members' income, or in, what their income is, but we were able to use some data to determine that we believe that there are a certain number of people under that annual income threshold and we built the model based on if every one of those families took advantage of it what what would that cost the school district and the taxpayers and the first year through it we approached our school board and we we said we believe we have roughly 400 families within the boundaries of council rock that may qualify um, and we would like to propose offering a 75 percent tax rebate on behalf of the district. We budgeted $250,000 for that, um, the first venture into that, and um, not a whole lot of people took advantage of it. And that is similar, I referenced another district earlier um, that, that I think less than 10% of the available people participated. Uh, because of that and because we're trying to grow this program, we continue to go out to our libraries and our senior centers and we partner with some of the people sitting up there with you in their offices and some people that aren't here today in their offices. Uh, and then this year, because we've been tracking the numbers, we, we, um, we did the same um, procedure, but rather than asking our board to reimburse our low income taxpayers 75 percent we asked for a hundred percent and once again we budgeted around a two hundred fifty thousand dollar mark last year we spent less than fifty thousand um, dollars and another challenge with with this program we have advertised it everywhere you can imagine from social media outlets to the old-fashioned newspapers to putting flyers up and the hard part is to try to make sure we get the information to all the seniors out there that may struggle with, you know, online and they're not getting social media and people aren't reading newspapers today like they used to. So we continue to look for ways to do that. And we have, we have asked our community and we've asked those folks who have come to our um, public presentations to make sure they spread the word. Well, I appreciate that, and I, I, I think uh, it's an incredible program, and I, every year in our office doing the state, we, we have new folks every year that probably have qualified for years for property tax rebates that just realize or learn about it, and, and, and I think getting that word out is really important, but what you guys are doing at the school district, I mean, it seems pretty, uh, it's not very cost prohibitive, it, it's, you know, uh, I think it's a, an incredible program, and something I'm going to take back to my district, and I appreciate your testimony. Representative Hogan. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Dr. Sanko, we've had conversations. You know, I represent a very small portion of the school district, but um, could, could you speak briefly about the impact of English as a second language is having on the district and, and financially as well? Sure. Thank you, Mr. Hogan. Um, so in Council Rock, and we're not like other, any other district in the county, we've seen this countywide, that uh, particularly with um, what happened in the Ukraine, we have seen an influx of English language learners. They are students who do not possess English as their primary language. Um, and we have an obligation as a school district to educate the kids that live underneath of our umbrella. And um, when students come to us who are non-English speaking or English is their second language, we have to provide them the best education we possibly can and we're happy to do it. Uh, we saw an influx in Council Rock uh, over the last two years of approximately 
a little bit north of 400 students who have joined us, or 10,500 students um, as English language learners. Uh, our school board has been responsive to and supportive of putting things in place so that we could help those students. Um, prior to this, Council Rock, we did not have a full-fledged uh, English language department and program. Over the last two years, we have hired additional uh, permanent teachers. We hired an, an EL coordinator, an English language coordinator. We have hired a handful, I wanna say four or five um, assistants, English language assistants. And so when students come to us as EL learners, not only are they entitled to the curriculum, but we also have to provide opportunities to them so that we can teach them the English language. Uh, that doesn't take away from where they may need help in math, in social studies, and science. So we've seen an influx not just in Council Rock, but across the county and the state. So, so how can we help as, as legislators with that? I mean, obviously the cost is one part of it, but is it also certification for these instructors? Is it uh, maybe a new grant program? Thank you. There is, there is an EL certification that PDE has. Um, and, um, but where, where you can help, I heard uh, Ms. Marcel and Mr. Hogan mention grants. If there was an opportunity for grants to help, help offset that cost um, in Council Rock for a full package for a new teacher, um, health care benefits, salary, um, PECERS contributions, we're knocking on the door of $80,000. Uh, and in, I'm speaking specifically to Council Rock, the vast majority of our tax money comes from the residents of the district, from the homeowners. Uh, we don't have strip malls or car dealerships or malls. Um, so a grant and an opportunity to, to help take some of that burden off of our taxpayers would be appreciated. Representative Williams. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to start by thanking Representative Marcel for hosting us up here. She has been an absolute thought leader when it comes to education issues. I love it when new members come to our caucus who have a background there because um, they become truly the, the inspiration behind some of these ideas. And Chairman Kale, um, I, you know, like Representative Rowe, I'm one of the frequent travelers for your policy committee hearings, and part of the reason that I do that is I always learn something. And today I have two brand new ideas that I intend to take back to my school districts. Um, and in fact, I was literally just texting my team saying we need to have a, a forum right now on property tax rebates so that we can start helping people realize that they have this opportunity. My question is about your Knights for Knowledge, um, because this is the one that's like, really got my attention. And I wanna tell you just a small, a small quick story about the experience in my family. Um, we had, at the time of the 2020 lockdown, one college student who was sent home with COVID, um, living in the basement until she recovered, and with me you know, getting all of her supplies at the top of the stairs so that she wouldn't have contact with the family. Um, a senior in high school, a, a seventh grader, just basically in the middle of middle school, and a fifth grader. Um, the person who I didn't really worry about was the fifth grader until much later. Um, <clears throat> his experience with the lockdown with two professional parents who each had a role in the pandemic in the corporate sector and in the government sector was that his fifth grade teacher would come on at eight o'clock in the morning, hand out assignments for 20 minutes and then school was over. And he was left to in, our, in the middle of our work day, in the middle of our school day, to fend for himself, and he just didn't do anything. Uh, we eventually got him caught up every weekend when mom and dad could give him some help. Um, what we weren't realizing in the moment was none of that content was going in because there became like this 40 to 50% expectation that if he just does something, it'll be good enough. That was the rest of his fifth grade experience. Checks into middle school, and now suddenly he's behind. Um, the good news is he's now going in 10th grade. Uh, he accept, accepted the fact that he needed tutoring help and he did it by way of this. He's a race car driver and in our house, his ability, his, his ability to continue racing cars is tied to his having an A in math. Um, so he has number one, an incentive. And he, was, he felt stigmatized at first by having to go get tutoring to get that A in math. He was a constant C to low B student. And then he found somebody that he dearly loved 
and now he looks forward to going to his tutoring session every week, and he's a like high A math guy as a result. I think it's because of incentive and because of after school help. Um, so I'm very intrigued by this, but here's my substantive question about it as I take this back home to Garnet Valley. Um, do you think that this is going to be an ongoing need for those kids who were at that true learning deficit in say fourth to sixth grade? Or is there, are we coming to a point of diminishing return? If I were to start this program now and continue it out for three more years until those classes graduate, are we getting to a point where they're caught up or do you think it's going to, to linger? Um, first, I think your son is a very good math student, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it's too early for us to tell that answer. I think I would answer it by saying there is no substitute for good teaching and learning uh, and face-to-face -face teaching and learning. Um, and, and, and you know every student is unique and different and everybody has a different learning style. So anytime you can offer tutoring or, or um, remediation or enrichment, somebody's going to benefit from it. We have seen in uh, Council Rock, um, in recent test scores, that our students are start, starting to rebound by way of performance numbers uh, as compared to what happened during the shutdown. Um, I'm a little hesitant to say we're there yet, um, but we are, we are watching that closely and we're tracking. We do believe there's enough merit in this program that, as I said earlier, we're still investigating it in, into this upcoming year. And we've also talked, you know, maybe taking another, another spin on it uh, by way of offering rather than third grade math, test taking skills, t study skills, test prep. Uh, we're not sure where we're going to go with it. So to, to answer your question, I can't give you a good answer if it's diminishing returns or not, but we are watching it closely and we feel relatively uh, good and satisfied that we're seeing some of our, particularly the high stakes testing numbers are rebounding to what they were pre-COVID. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with the sentiment that, that no extra learning is wasted, right? And you know, my, my children teach me more than I often teach them, or at least I can still learn from them. And last year, one of Cole's classmates came up to him and said, I don't get it. You were like in the middle of the pack in honors math, and now you're, you're like leading the way. What changed? And he goes, uh, I hate to be the one to break it to you, but you have to work hard at it. Um, and, that, that, and, 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 um, and he literally said it to him just like that. He's like, I work much harder than I ever have at math, um, and now I'm enjoying it. And that statement that he repeated to me that he said to one of his friends taught me something which is maybe we don't have a learning deficit maybe we untaught work ethic and i think some of these kids are having to relearn how much work has to go into school to be good at it and we we adults call it learning how to school i think they forgot how to school because we untaught them because they got days off for about six months um, thank you so much i'm definitely taking these ideas home all right, any other questions before I ask a question and we then move on to the second panel? Dr. Sanko, thank you for being here. Thank you for your testimony. Representative Marcel, thank you for your leadership on these issues. I, I second what Representative Williams said. It is nice to have people that have a background in truly understanding the inside outs of education or any field uh, that they might come from. Dr. Sanko, I, I, have, uh, I have a number of children and I, recognize that, that I, yeah, I have eight eight children and I recognize that uh, that they're the way they learn is is different and each kid is going to be going at different routes so when you, when you talked about steam programs in the technology school that type of thing intrigues me because I I know at least one of my kids I could see now is geared towards that type of mindset uh, maybe an engineering mindset maybe just a, a builder um, architect something like that he likes being outside he likes building things he, he learns differently he thinks differently I'm curious you know when I was in high school uh, 20 years ago this this summer it's 20 years um, when I was in high school uh, there were really two options that my guidance counselor gave me it was go to the military or go to college and 
I struggle with this myself now with my own children uh, because we go around the state and we hear all of this uh, talk about the demand for uh, blue collar jobs, demand for jobs that are, um, you know, don't require a four year degree. They're, they're becoming more technical, so maybe some sort of training is required in it from a technology standpoint, but they don't require the traditional four year degree. Yet at the same time, my presupposition for my children is you're going to college. And it's just because that's kind of what was drilled into my brain. I know that's not right from a statistical standpoint or from a needs of the Commonwealth standpoint. I'm curious, does your program uh, at the technology school, does it, or within your high school, do you guys work with local companies and place people, uh, potential graduates with local companies or other companies, or is it just more or less placing them in, in higher education? Uh, thanks. So there's a lot to that question, and you're a busy man with eight children. Um, so as I said, the STEAM program in Council Rock is at the elementary level. Long before we had that program at the elementary level, um, probably definitely when I was in high school, but probably when you were in high school too, we had things called like industrial arts and home ec, and all those things have changed. Now it's family consumer science. Um, and it's, it's, um, it's not industrial arts anymore. So at our secondary level, we've been offering kids STEAM opportunities by way of class and by way of experience through clubs. Um, uh, one club that comes to mind, we have something at our high school called the Hunch Program, where kids volunteer after hours and they work directly with, with NASA to create underwater or in space uh, robotics and they have competitions. Um, so the way we see this STEAM program is that the current last year sixth grader, when they go to seventh grade because we break at grade six and then seven, they're going to be better armed to go into seventh grade and expand that program. And then when the students leave eighth grade and go into the high schools, they're gonna be able to expand that program by way of content knowledge and creative problem, uh, creative problem solving. And so we do a little bit of everything that you, you said. We, we partner, unofficially partner with some companies. We have students that are already out um, uh, to their own credit getting Microsoft certifications uh, not, as not even being part of the, of the school district. We have students who are producing uh, videos and TV shows. Um, so you will learn a lot more when, um, when Dr. Covell talks to you about the program right here at MBIT. Our students bring those skills from underneath the Council Rock umbrella into the uh, MBIT underneath this umbrella, but we do partner the Bucks County Intermediate Unit uh, that really is our touchstone for the 13 districts in the county. They have a program where our districts can partner with uh, with local businesses. And, you know, I, I think about um, all those things and the stuff that we read, you know, they talk about young people entering the workforce will have five different jobs between employment and retirement. And some of those jobs, we don't even know what they are. And that's why the critical thinking and the creative problem solving and the relationship building is so important. And that's some of the, the open-minded creative thinking we aspire for in, um, in our STEAM program. And I think of one student I had, uh, I was a, a principal of an elementary school and uh, Dr. Covell just had him here last year as a, uh, a graduate. And, um, he was a builder, he was a tinkerer, he was um, all those things, and he won a state competition, I think a half a million dollar scholarship uh, coming out of MBIT, and he's in the auto world, auto mechanic world. And, and, and uh, so yes, um, those opportunities are there, and it's our job as the educators to do our best to match those students up with their interests. Thank you. Doctor, thank you for your testimony today. And uh, if there's no further question, uh, you may take a seat or head out or do whatever you need to do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yep. Our second panel, uh, the Middle Bucks Institute of Technology panel, uh, if you all would come up to the table here and we will get your 
name plaques ready, and we'll go from there. See you later, Greg. Good seeing you. Thanks for being here. For this panel, we have four testifiers. Our first testifier is Dr. Mark Koval. Doctor, thank you for being here. Uh, the Director of Middle Bucks Institute of Technology, Bob Hickey, the President of Middle Bucks Institute of Technology, uh, Executive Council, and we have Thomas McCullough, I hope I pronounced that correctly, the uh, MBIT, Middle Bucks Institute of Technology graduate and local business owner. And we have Carla Zapetek, sorry, if I Zapotic, I'm sorry, Zapotic. My staff tried even coaching me on that, and I, I think I do it on purpose now, just the, but Zapotic, thank you for being here. Executive Vice President, the Home Builders Association. Doctor, the floor is yours, uh, three to five minutes if, if possible, um, but uh, then we'll ask questions, thank you. My staff shudders when I am in front of a microphone. There's never been a microphone I didn't enjoy, so. <laughs> run for office. We'll do the best that we can. Um, thank you very much for inviting me to speak about the importance of career and technical education. Uh, first, welcome to Middle Bucks Institute of Technology. It is an honor to host today's House Policy Hearing. And we are excited to share our experiences and facilities with you to help inform education and CTE policy in our Commonwealth. Middle Bucks Institute of Technology prepares today's students for tomorrow's emerging technologies and provides students with the competitive edge needed for employment in a global marketplace and success in post-secondary education. We are a school of choice designed for students seeking to enhance their educational program with highly relevant career and technical experience connected directly to the real world of business and industry. Over 400 business and industry advisors annually review and update our school's educational program. And the MBIT experience provides students with a blend of classroom theory, technical applications, and in state-of-the-art laboratories and off-campus work-based experiences. Students learn and apply core academic areas, including literacy, numeracy, science, communications, and technology in a way that has personal meaning and career relevance. The educational program here at MBIT is organized around five broad career pathways and offers 21 state-approved career pathway programs. More than 900 students attend the daytime program, and we also serve more than 500 adults who are enrolled in evening education programs, as well as customized industry training programs. The staff consists of approximately 35 professional educators and 30 support personnel. Instruction is individualized self-paced, and highly personalized. Second, we all appreciate the legislature's support for career and technical education. As you know, career and technical education is an integral part of the state economic and workforce development system and a critical pathway for those in Pennsylvania's public education system, which serves secondary students and adults. At MBIT, we are seeking, I'm sorry, at MBIT, we are seeing record interest in our school, record enrollment in our programs, and record achievement from our students. We are seeing the highest NOCTI scores in nearly 10 years, with 89% of our students achieving competent or advanced on their end of year program, end of program exams. And we recently inducted more students into our National Technical Honor Society than ever before. We know that career and technical education must serve the needs of business and industry by delivering programs that meet national skill standards and offer recognized credentials. I'm proud to share that students at MBIT completed 1,881 Pennsylvania Department of Education industry recognized credentials in 2023-2024. We work closely with businesses in our communities to ensure that our curriculum reflects their needs so our students can fill jobs and build careers in our communities. We also work closely with our, legislatures, uh, our legislators to provide input on policy and discuss funding needs. We appreciate your responsiveness and know that you prioritize workforce development and career and technical education. 
Today's hearing hosted by Representative Marcel. She's a champion of career and technical education. As a former member of the Council Rock School, School Board, she served as a member of our Middle Bucks Institute of Technology Executive Council. She has been and remains a fierce advocate for career and technical education and was a strong voice in supporting additional funding in the most re recent budget. According to the funding letter she and her colleagues authored to support CTE, quote, investing in CTE is not just an investment in our students and workers, but in the future economic vitality of Pennsylvania as a whole. I could not agree more. Thank you for hosting the hearing today, Representative Marcel. The most recent budget provides significant investments in career and technical education, including a $12.7 million increase for the CTE subsidy, boosting it to $144 million, a $5 million increase in career and technical education equipment grants, ensuring state-of-the-art resources for CTE programs, and a 19% boost in apprenticeship funding. In fact, Middle Bucks Institute of Technology is leading the way with 68 students in registered apprenticeship programs through the PA SMART grant, expanding career pathways in carpentry, electrical, HVAC, plumbing, and welding. With the new funding allocation, we are looking to work with our partners in workforce development to continue to expand this opportunity to more programs and to more students. Beyond funding, the budget required that the data used to calculate the career and technical education funding be fixed on June 1st each year. This change gives career and technical education centers, or CTCs, greater predictability over their budgets and aligns with the CTE funding formula with the special education and basic education funding formulas. Although it was part of the budget, it was also introduced as standalone legislation and supported by many members of the policy committee and wider caucus. Candidly, this is a huge impact on our school and allows predictability in our budgets, and we thank you very much for passing that legislation. We appreciate your time, attention, and support of our schools, students, and faculty. Finally, we want to work closely with you to build the strongest workforce in the country right here in Pennsylvania. We believe all citizens have the right to, to quality, affordable, accessible career and technical education. This means that our schools need more funding through the CTE subsidy, especially as career and technical education becomes a more attractive pathway for students and learners throughout our Commonwealth. Additionally, we need, need to ensure that our school's equipment is state of the art. Technology is constantly changing, and if we want our students to be prepared for their careers in their fields, we must ensure that they, they work on the tools that our businesses use now and will use in the future. Simply, we need to make sure that the equipment grant line is fully funded. Last, we all need to work together to reduce barriers and provide incentives so that educators, more educators, especially those with career experience, can join our classrooms and teach our students. The legislature has made strides in credential changes, but we must do more to maintain a strong pipeline of faculty and educators for specialized fields. Thank you for having us today. We're proud to host and we're proud to answer the questions that, that will help you craft policies and strengthen and improve our CTE programs to make them more responsive to the needs of business and the workforce. Thank you. Mr. Hickey. Good morning. It is my pleasure and good fortune to be a small part of this hearing. First, I would like to thank everyone attending for their dedication to educating today's youth. This includes school administrators, legislatures, fellow presenters, and guests. A special thank you to Representative Marcel for hosting this event. Kristen has become a good friend through her mentoring of me in my new role as a school board member at both Council Rock and MBIT, which has led to this privilege today. My name is Bob Hickey, and I am a member of the Council Rock School District and MBIT Executive Council. It is through this collective effort that we can achieve two goals, and borrowing from both the Council Rock and MBIT mottos, they are students first always and preparing tomorrow's workforce today. Dr. Sanko and Mr. Roosevelt testified today on behalf of the important strides Council Rock is making in regards to moving our district forward educationally. This is especially true as we continue to dig out from the negative effects of COVID and its lockdowns. Dr. Covell, he extolled the virtues of MBIT and its many offerings. Mr. McCullough, he will relay his own personal narrative. My testimony 
is my perspective on the evolution of education in my adult lifetime and the need for balance in both academic and career technical education, from which I will refer to simply as CTE. When I grew up in high school, when I grew up in Philadelphia, I attended Father Judge High School. It was, and still is, a well-respected academics-based school. Kids who attended CTE at the Swenson Skill Center were few and far between. And I believe that program was primarily dissolved or primarily designed for those interested in automotive technology. As a matter of fact, I don't believe I knew anyone who attended. After getting married and having a family of my own, circumstances gave me the opportunity to move to Bucks County. My wife and I specifically chose Council Rock for its exemplary academic standing in the state. Parents still move to the district today for the same reason. CTE was viewed over the years as a negative for kids who didn't fit in, for students who struggled academically, for those with little direction, or for those with IEPs. More of an afterthought than an alternative. If your child did not go to college, something was amiss. Even our high schools are ranked by some metrics that include what percentage of graduates go to college. But over the course of the last decade or so, something happened. Colleges became less and less affordable to the average family. Some parents and students discovered that the tools they needed to succeed were not even being taught in college. Others quickly found out that the wages earned for a college education were not in line with the cost of a degree. College debt was skyrocketing. In the meantime, Demand for skilled workers, plumbers, electricians, carpenters, and welders, to name a few, workers who could use both their hands and their heads, was exploding. In today's society, with many double-income parents, quality outside daycare has become a necessity. Today, MBIT offers a program to address this. Jobs for health professionals like dental hygienists and certified nursing assistants abound. And with the everyday technological advances, careers like graphic arts, computer technology, cybersecurity, and web design are needed more than ever. This just scratches the surface. And to top it off, these are well-paying careers, not just jobs. Slowly but surely, and also thankfully, the stigma of career technical education is being erased. Applications are at all-time high. Attendance is through the roof. One of the biggest obstacles today at MBIT is we are turning away deserving students. We have neither the manpower nor the space to serve our students adequately. Presently, we are in the final stages of completing a state-of-the-art welding facility that costs north of $1 million. This will double the amount of our student population in one of our most popular programs. Dr. Covell and his staff are constantly seeking cost-effective ways to expand and stay current with the ever-changing landscape. And this is not unique to MBIT. Even my old high school, known primarily for its, full, for its strong academics, is investing money in a technology and welding center. I attended college. My 10 siblings attended college. My eight children attended college. With that history, I still firmly believe that college is not for everyone. Conversely, everyone is not good with their hands. Each person needs to discover that skill set which will lead to a productive career. In some ways, my current role is a microcosm of our educational system today. I need to be a proponent of both academic excellence and technical expertise, providing each with what they need to succeed without doing so at the expense of the other. Your roles as administrators and legislatures demand the same balance. I thank you for offering, for, I thank you for your efforts in striving for this goal. Your presence today speaks volumes as to your dedication to our students today. Thank you. Mr. McCullough. Good morning. I want to thank Representative Kristen Marcel for inviting me to share my experiences related to MBIT and how my education here has affected my life. Fifty years ago, while I was just entering high school, it became obvious to me that attending a four-year college was not going to be an option. My father had just ventured out on his own starting a new distribution business, 
and as is common for small business startups, it was a struggle. My father expressed hope that someday I might join him in this business venture. I met with a guidance counselor and he suggested looking into Middlebuck's Vocational Technical School as it was known back then. He told me there was a new program called Design Technology. This program involved mechanical drawing and drafting. There was also a great emphasis on math, particularly advanced geometry. He arranged a tour for me and I decided to enroll. In 11th and 12th grades, I attended my home school, William Tennant High School, in the morning and the afternoon session at Middle Bucks. My teacher, Mr. Katz, had worked as an engineer in the space program. He taught us not only how to read blueprints, but also how to draw them. I remember one of his sayings that stuck with me was, when you're building spaceships, 99% right is 100% wrong. I think Elon Musk would agree. The geometry I learned at my home school never made much sense to me. Mr. Jorgensen was my geometry chair, teacher at Middle Bucks, and all of a sudden, when challenged with making accurate drawings of various parts, geometry made total sense. I needed to see a practical application for this to happen. Back then, there were no computers, no CAD systems, no handheld calculators. We drew on drafting tables using a pencil, compass, triangles, a French curve, and various templates. We did all our calculations by hand. Shortly before graduation, a Middle Bucks counselor called me into a meeting to discuss job placement. A company in Philadelphia had called Middle Bucks and explained they needed a layout fabricator. This was a job in a union shop. The counselor arranged a plant tour and interview. The company made me an offer and I decided to take the job. A week after graduating, I was working full time gaining valuable experience and earning a paycheck with no college loans. It was not an easy job, but it was challenging. The job required hands-on geometry, taking parts on a blueprint, laying it out on sheets and plates of stainless steel so the welders could put it all together. The education I received at Middle Bucks gave me the skills needed to be successful in this field. The products we, we built were flares that go on top of oil drilling rigs, when we shipped the flare to be mounted 300 feet up in the air over the North Sea, it better fit. It was my responsibility to make sure we got it right before it left our plant. After two years, I was promoted to fabricator grade A. So here I was, at age 20, a member of the United Steelworkers of America and the highest paid person in the entire shop. I stayed in this job for about three years. When it became apparent that the union was going to strike, I took another layout job for higher pay closer to home. In 19, 1981, I went to work in my father's business. We sold carbide cutting tools, bandsaw blades and machines, grinding wheels, and a full assortment of related accessories. In 1999, my father retired and I purchased the company. We have a wide, wide variety of customers and it still amazes me that we supply tools that make everything from medical parts to coins at the U.S. Mint to propellers for the United States Navy nuclear submarines. My job today sometimes requires me to interpret a customer's part drawing and figure out what method and tooling will best do the job. I still utilize the skills learned at Metal Bucks and have never regretted, even for one minute, my decision to go to school here. I now have two of my children in the business and will soon be passing the torch to them. Deciding on a career or course of study is a big decision. I believe far too many high school students decide to attend a four-year college without considering a vocational education. So many graduate with debt they cannot pay because they were sold a degree for which no market exists. I highly recommend that unless students have a specific career goal, career goal that requires a specific college degree, that they at least take a tour and see what courses and career opportunities technical education has to offer. Speaking to your to you to hear today was a great honor. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Patek. Good afternoon. Thank you for having me. It's a privilege to be here to discuss the advancement of career and technical education programs, and especially to Representative Marcel for thinking of me to share the, my experiences. The Home Builders Association is a nonprofit trade organization representing over 500 me members in the residential construction industry. Our mission is to build great homes, strong communities, and be better businesses. And we accomplish that through advocacy, education, and networking. 
Prior to my employment with the HBA, I stumbled into the building industry by chance after realizing law school was not my path. So I took a job selling building products. This path led me to help run our family-owned construction company as a local custom builder in southeastern PA for 10 plus years. Now to the present day, where I now run the Home Builders Association. We're the largest state association in Pennsylvania and have received national recognition for a quest to develop a skilled workforce to address the construction industry's labor shortage. The HBA is affiliated with the National Association of Home Builders and our student chapter was formed through that affiliation. Middlebucks Institute of Technology is a student chapter member and they were featured in that national rec recognition where we hosted nearly 300 students from the construction clusters at our first career fair on, in, on construction day. The need for more skilled construction labor is a significant obstacle to expanding home construction, improving housing inventory, and making homes more affordable. Sustainable inflation relies on the advancement of later labor productivity, worker training, labor recruitment, and housing price, price growth reductions. The residential construction labor force plays a critical role in attaining the economic and social policy objectives by providing affordable housing which helps alleviate the inflation in the housing sector, sector. To tackle the nation's housing shortage, an estimated 1.5 million homes needs to be built during the second half of this decade. And that is where we need additional skilled workers. Some key findings are in the downturn from construction of 2023 post-pandemic to 2024, there was a decrease in the amount of construction workers. To build homes, we need 723,000 workers per year in our industry. And currently we have 400,000 jobs open. Average hourly wages and overall construction industry have increased by about 5% over the last year with the average wage levels exceeding national private sector averages. Women make up a growing share of the construction employment, reaching 10.9% back in 2022, which has gone down a, a slight amount since then, um, where it was its highest at 2021. These numbers reflect a growing need for labor, particularly at the home and the home building industry, as we rec recover from the weakness that began in 2022 due to the tightening monetary policy. Not only are we facing a challenge of skilled labor, work, labor shortage, but we are also facing a shortage of the CTE teachers. Several factors contribute to this decline. Higher enrollment rates for students in the CTE programs courses result in a higher demand for more teachers. Education programs have been eliminated and or limited for someone to transition from the industry into teaching at a CTE school. There is limited funding that many would need to afford these courses, leaving most paying out of pocket. With the collaboration of our state legislator, legislators, we aim to explore al alternative methods for individuals to obtain their teaching licenses more, efficiency, more efficiently in Pennsylvania. Prospective teachers should be able to demonstrate their qualifications through occupational testing, professional certification, or work experience. We need to create more incentives to recruit industry professionals into the classroom, both in professional development and salary. Our organization manages several committees and councils that advocate for fair and smart housing legislation, charitable initiatives, mentoring women in the trades, and cultivating the future workforce. Our Workforce Development Council, in partnership with our student chapter members, has developed programs to tackle these challenges. These initiatives aim to provide students with direct access to internships, co-op programs, apprenticeships, and job opportunities, allowing them to develop leadership skills and gain insight into their chosen careers. Some of the programs that we have developed, which are not limited to, are Careers in Construction Day and Career Fairs, Professional Development Days, where we offer resume building and interview skills with these students in these programs, in-class instruction sessions for hands-on experiences with our members, and course curriculum certification through the Pennsylvania Builders Association. 
In addition to these efforts, we fundraise to provide student achievement awards and scholarships to deserving students who participate in our student chapter. These funds can be used to advance each student's career in construction, whether it's to buy new tools or to pay for continuing education. With more funding opportunities, a goal we strive toward is to provide monetary awards to the teachers in the classrooms, pursuing professional development as well as their students. I thank you all for this time and the opportunity to share our positive experiences working with our local career and technical schools, specifically Middle Bucks. We appreciate your ongoing support and willingness to listen. Representative Marcel. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you so much for all of you testifying today. I really appreciate all of the work that you're doing and all the experiences that you were able to share with us. Um, so it was very interesting. There are a couple of thoughts that came together while you were all speaking and testifying. Uh, so the motto of MBIT is preparing tomorrow's workforce today. And I think just from serving on the MBIT board and now being a state legislator that MBIT and all of the tech schools in Bucks County and, and probably throughout the state, there are a number of tech schools that are doing a wonderful job. Um, he, I don't know, Mark didn't have a chance to share this in his testimony, but he actually has uh, t-shirts that say support the trades for MBIT. I'm very happy that I now you know have one. Um, and uh, there's also a, a special MBIT chant that's done at some of the uh, school assemblies and, and when they're giving awards out. It's, it's a very special community. There's a lot of enthusiasm at this school. And so when we talk about that stigma changing, I think that stigma in a great way, it, it, it's changing. You know, maybe there's a little bit more we can do there, but the schools and the communities are really embracing career and technical education, which is a wonderful thing for our workforce because, um, you know, as we've been mentioning, the workforce needs for the future we're, we're not going to meet them if we can't keep up in Pennsylvania. And so my question for you um, is that, you know, we see the stigma changing. We see that our workforce needs to change. We need to meet, you know, for all of these different, um, you know, trades positions and, and different jobs in the, in the future. Um, I don't know about you, but I feel like the, there is a, a real sense of urgency that we while we're supporting CTE funding and we're doing all the things, um, Dr. Cavell, that you mentioned, I feel like there's a kind of a larger urgency here that we need to be acting within the next year or two to really put emphasis on making some positive changes in this area, whether it's making it easier for uh, instructor certifications or you know whatever it might be. I'm not the expert here, but I think that we really need to prioritize that. Um, and so I'm wondering if you have any policy ideas for us to think about going back to Harrisburg in, at the end of September um, and also thinking about next year when we're in a new session so that we can really help to prioritize the focus on CTE. You know, we've looked at basic funding um, for education. We've looked at making some changes um, through the education code on higher education. But I really think like now is the time to focus on CTE and to make sure that we're really pressing forward so that we can meet the needs of our workforce. Um, and so if you wouldn't mind sh just sharing any thoughts you have, um, I'd love to hear them. Thank you. So I appreciate that very, very much. Um, I, I agree with you. I think that the time is now for some bold action relative to career and technical education. And when I say that, uh, our school is nearly 60 years old here. We have uh, rooftop units that are controlling the HVAC that are all at the end of their serviceable life. There are millions and millions of dollars of just simple maintenance that we could do today that won't increase our enrollment, that won't increase our ability to, uh, to train a, a growing workforce, the workforce needs of our country and of our commonwealth. And so I think it's time to consider what sort of bold action we can take to really invest in what schools like ours need so that we can meet the the demands. You know, Mr. Hickey mentioned that that most every career technical center in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania has wait lists to enter their schools. And while that allows us to, to hopefully find the right program for the right student for the right reason, it also means that there is a, a potential plumber that is not getting trained. That means that there's a potential welder that isn't working on the key bridge right now because we weren't able to, to have a seat for them. And so when I say bold action, I mean looking at really what it would take 
to, to modernize these buildings and meet the demands and the capacity of those schools so that we are, are able to meet the needs of, of all the students that want to access this style of education. Uh, so that's the first thing that comes to mind. I think that you know this, but I'll say it uh, out loud. I'm incredibly passionate about trying to change the perceptions of CTE. These are not necessarily just blue collar jobs. These are new collar jobs. And when we say just, we diminish the work that we do here. This is not just a blue collar job. This is exactly what our country needs. When we have times of struggle here in our country, we are oftentimes leaning on career and technically trained folks to help us out. When I-95 collapses in Philadelphia, who do we call first? First responders who are being trained in our public safety program. Who do we call next? Folks that are doing those mechanical drawings to help us engineer it. Who do we call next? Folks that are going to drive the equipment or, or construct the, the actual repair to build us back better, right? When the key bridge goes down, we need welders. We need first responders. We need folks in, in our culinary program just to take care of the needs of folks. We need our media students who uh, are here as interns this summer and, and help us on our social media so that we can get our authentic message out. But we need media folks that document the progress. And so these are critical, cr whenever this country has been in need, oftentimes it's been career and technically trained folks that are the ones that have to answer that call. And so I think now that that perception is changing, I hate to say it, but uh, when, we, when we advocated college for all, we may have accidentally been, been, been saying without saying, trades for none. And, and now that that's changing, and I grew up in a, in a community very similar to, to the one in which I serve now. Uh, I was a student who met with my counselor, and it was college or work, right? And it really it was, it was college or nothing uh, in the community that I grew up in. And so now that that's changing, I think we have to be prepared to meet that uh, demand and meet that need. Yeah, just a couple. I don't know specifically what can be done, although someone did mention maybe one of the things that can be done is, for example, there aren't enough teachers and there isn't enough infrastructure for this, but maybe to get more teachers not necessarily to cut corners, but there's so many hurdles that someone who is in the field now making 50 and $60 an hour, you know, to come into the teaching part of it, they have to go to school for two and three years just to get their certifications, not to train, but to teach. And, and I don't know how you can cut through the red tape because like I said, you don't want to you don't want to shortchange the kids on what they need to do. You know, you, you need to have the right people in the classrooms training these kids. So there are certain hurdles you have to, but what are those hurdles? Can you cut down the process instead of it taking two years? Is there any way for it to take a year? Is, is there grants that are maybe for, for, for workers who are interested in teaching? Maybe there's grants available for those teachers where at least they don't have to pay for the cost of their college education or their certifications in order to teach what to do about you know the, the infrastructure i don't i don't really know uh you know we talk about oh well maybe we could knock out a, this wall here and build back i mean i know we did some innovative things here to make some expansions hey this room can be repurposed you know maybe this program doesn't work anymore and maybe we should pivot to doing something else but what happened was it kind of exploded very quickly and there wasn't a whole lot of time to prepare um are there, i don't know of any quick solutions but you know maybe there's a way to cut through you know as you know governmentally and educationally there is a lot of red tape that possibly we can at least streamline the process or offer some incentives to those workers in order to teach the programs that we need um i can only tell you that as a sales company, we sell to a wide variety of uh, customers, like I mentioned, um, welding shops, um, fabrication shops, machine shops, along with manufacturers that, that have their own machining capabilities. Um, and it's almost every day one of them asks me if, we know, if I know anybody that's looking for a job because they can't find qualified help. There is definitely a shortage of people in, in industry.
Um, we. We've been uh, researching several states across the country to see what other workforce development councils are doing. Um, specifically, Washington State has a phenomenal program that they are modeling and now bringing it to Rhode Island. Um, in our journey, we've, we've been researching what some of these states have been doing, and one of their biggest thing, it, things is remaining flexible with the certification process for these teachers to transition and they're coming from a, a, a much larger salary at, at one point to maybe taking a significant pay decrease. Um, so the, the flexibility there for a teacher to become certified in a less than six year period um, to be able to transition into that, it, it, remaining flexible would be a, a good benefit to, to all. Um, but I do think some states definitely have some model programs that we can look into a little further um, to see what they're doing um, as far as professional development for everyone transitioning into the teaching industry. Representative Stats. Thank you, Chairman Kale, and thank you, Representative Marcel, for hosting today's hearing. Thank you for your time and thank you for your testimony. I think everyone up there has talked about the uh, high demand for CTE programs. Um, and Dr. Cavell, you had mentioned the, the wait list uh, that many schools do have. I know in Upper Bucks, uh, we had 170 students last year on the wait list. Um, so I guess my question is, is, what are we doing to address that? Uh, the school districts that I represent, Penn Ridge, Quakertown, Palisades, they're creating some trade programs to help address the, uh, the demand. Uh, Bucks County Community College is creating some trade programs to help address that as well. Um, what are some things that you might be doing here? So first things first, we're expanding programs when and where we can. Um, and I just want to mention, though, that that's a double-edged sword because you can't just infinitely expand programs and not think about what it takes to support those programs. Uh, so that may mean more school counselors here to support the, the students in their transition after, after high school. That may mean more folks in your business office who uh, will need to, to take on the demand of more purchasing. So it's, it's broader than just hiring a teacher and having a space for them. Uh, but I will say that we're doubling the capacity of our welding program. So what we do here is we look at where we have consistent demand that we're not able to meet. Uh, so in our case right now, it's welding, followed by electrical, followed by some of the health uh, occupations. And so systematically and trying to do so in a way that it does not uh, cause our budget to explode because we have to be mindful of, of the cost of these, of these things, um, we try to systematically roll out those program expansions. And so it's incremental growth in those areas. Uh, unfortunately, that doesn't necessarily fix the acute issue of the demand right now, the student today, but it does help to address the future demand. Uh, and, th and that's how we've addressed it here so far. Something else I'll just throw out there as an observation. As I talk to friends and neighbors in my district, I hear employers say they can't find workers, and then workers tell me they can't find jobs. So I think that's something we all need to kind of take a look at and make sure we're, we're getting those folks together. But thank you. Thanks again for your time. Representative Labs. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you all for your testimony today. Um, I have two questions. One, I'll start with Dr. Cavell. Um, so I represent four school districts, um, which send to both Upper Bucks and Middle Bucks Tech Schools. So I'm a huge proponent and advocate for you know what you do and what you're doing for our students, so thank you. Um, one of the things that you had mentioned was you work closely with local businesses to help form your curriculum, um, you know, to determine the needs of what the local businesses need. Um, one thing that we talk about a lot up here is not only growing the workforce, but keeping the workforce in Pennsylvania. Um, that's something that's really important. So I feel like that is important in this conversation, right? determining the needs of our community and, and formulating your curriculum around that. So what are those needs? Um, and do they, you know, match with your high demand um, courses that students are looking into, if that makes sense? So I'll, I'll answer that um, 
this way and then let me know if there's a follow-up. So we, each of our programs uh, must have, as we have 21 career technical programs here at Middle Bucks, each of those has an occupational advisory council, an OAC. So each one of those OACs meets twice a year to advise on equipment and on curriculum. And so uh, it's up to the teacher to build those networks in order to expand uh, those business offerings. Now, we do have a great partnership with our Bucks County IU folks who are working on a workforce development initiative. And so that, for a new teacher who may not be familiar with that process, could be very, very helpful. So we're, we're thankful for their work. Um, but those occupational advisory councils then advise our programs. And so when we need to, say, make a purchase for a program, especially for grant programs, uh, their grant request must be OAC approved. And just so we're talking about actual dollars and cents here, last year our, our um, the supplemental equipment grant was funded at about $200,000. Uh, because of the allocation timeline that, that I spoke about in my testimony, we weren't sure until later in the year how much we were going to be allocated. So we started our year with a faculty meeting to say, if you have an equipment need, you have to let us know because we're hearing that it's being funded more robustly and we want to be able to meet the needs of your programs with, with this new funding. So the funding comes in at $200 million of OAC approved equipment requests in my 21 career technical programs here, the ask was over a million dollars. So it will take me five years to meet just the current list that I have funded at $200,000 just to get the programs what their OACs say they need right now. And in those five years, we all know what's going to happen. Businesses and industries are going to evolve and their needs are going to change. And so that's the carrot we're always chasing um, or, or, or the burden we're always trying to meet, which is making sure that we are preparing our students for tomorrow and today. And if they're saying that those, those needs in equipment are this million dollars of equipment, I can only meet the $200,000 need that we have. So when I, when I talk about fully funding the supplemental equipment grant, those are, those are the very real stories from just this, this building here that that have uh, those significant needs hopefully that answers your question yeah absolutely and hopefully that's something that we can help with um thank you very much my second question is for mr hickey um you spoke about the needs of outside child care um i am a mother of two young kids and i actually co-chair the early childhood education caucus in the house um, so this is something we talk about all the time, the many needs of this area and really the economic driver that quality, dependable child care can offer. Um, so you said that, that there's a program that MBIT offers to address this. Can you just elaborate on that a little bit? Uh, well, like you said, they have, there's actually a program. Oh, excuse me. Thank you. Um, MBIT does offer an early childhood education class. You know, it's one of the programs here where they, uh, you know, they actually take care of children and learn some of the ins and outs of what you need to do. Also, in it's not really in conjunction, but we have a partner here, uh, Little Bucks, that is actually a daycare for kids, you know, that the parents pay a fee. They come in, they drop off their children, they pick them up and, you know, it's a reasonable fee that's, you know, they have to apply for it and you have to get accepted to it. And, you know, our students can help service that as well as a professional staff that they have. But that's only, like I said, one of the, pro you know, that's a, I don't want to say a smaller program because they're all important, but it is something that they're training high school students to become proficient in that so that when they graduate that they can work for these other daycare centers and at least have the experience, the hands-on experience, to be able to take care of your children and anybody else's children that need to be. And it's it's an unfortunate situation um, where we do have double income families. I, you know, uh, you, you try your best maybe to try to avoid it, but in some cases it's not, it's not avoidable any, any longer. And I mean, even in Council Rock, when we talked about we, we, we just converted to full day kindergarten. And one of the big drivers, if you asked parents, was the need for that extra daycare, you know, for, for their children, uh, aside from the educational advantages that it may offer. 
you know, it, when you ask parents, it was like, well, you know what? Half day kindergarten is just killing me because I work. How do I pick up my child and how do you do that? So, like I said, we have a smaller program. It could probably be expanded as well, but there's only so many, so much room and so much space that you can do this. But we, we do offer at least a, an elementary program where they can get the experience to even find out if they are interested in a career like that because it doesn't necessarily lead to a career in taking care of children. It might lead to a career like, I wanna be an early childhood education teacher or something along those lines. Not everybody who comes to these schools, they don't just go out into the workforce. Many other students, they do go on to either community college or four-year colleges. It's just another avenue. It's an opportunity for kids to get experience to find out that maybe what they want to do with the rest of their life because most 18, 19 year old kids, they don't know what they want to do with the rest of their life and rightfully so. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. It's a, it's a step. So thanks. Representative Tomlinson. Thank you all so much for your testimony. Um, as we all know, funding's always an issue. We all work very, very hard as legislators to bring back as much as we possibly can for our districts. And I know that you guys mentioned earlier that you connect with local businesses and um, hopefully are able to set up students with jobs, but do you also connect with them to see if they can contribute or donate um, things to the school? Like I know in my, in the tech school nearest my district, um, they talked about how difficult it was that now that the car industry is changing, they have all these old cars that kids can learn on, but now that there's electric cars, they have students that need to learn how to work on electric cars as well. And they were able to connect with the local dealership and they were able to donate an electric car so these kids can learn. Is that happening up here too? It's certainly something that, that we make every effort uh, to do. And we, we do have several partners that are willing to donate and make donations to our school. We received several vehicles uh, from a dealership recently. Uh, the community has been, been kind in donating as well. Uh, it's also something that I'd like to uh, be better at and see what we can do. You know, to that end, we, we just started an educational foundation for Middle Bucks Institute of Technology so that we can focus those efforts even more deliberately to try to, to fundraise and, and to try to solicit uh, in a more direct manner for just this Career Technical Center. Wonderful. Well, if there's any ways, legislators, we can help in that process, please reach out. Thank you. Thank you again. All right. Any other, any other questions before I ask a couple questions? I, I have a general question to start off with. And what, uh, does anyone know what the amount the state gives the CTE programs across the Commonwealth? Do you have any idea what the total amount is? I, I do. It was in my testimony. I believe okay. $147 million. 144. And it 144. was a 12%, $12.7 million increase, which was 12% to the CTE subsidy, boosting it to $144 million. Which, uh, that, that's a, you know, a, a good-sized number. but Sizable I. Amount. I just, um, we talk about, you know, uh, college or nothing. Um, how much do we give to higher education a year? Is it what, two point something billion um, total? Uh, so I, I think there's some work that we need to do as legislators to do more than just uh, lip service collectively, not anyone in particular, but collectively. So I, I, I do think, and I just want to ask this question briefly before we close up. Um, one of the problems we hear all the time that there's a shortage of people, there's a shortage of workforce, at the same time there's a shortage of housing, um, which is an interesting dilemma to have. Me and Mr. Hickey are doing the best we can with uh, you know, developing our own workforce uh, at home. And, uh, and so, but I, I just, I wonder, um, we, we have traveled a lot around the, the Commonwealth and we've talked a lot uh, about education. One of the things that I really can't quite get my head around and put my thumb on is how we measure success in education. And I'm wondering if how we are measuring success with K through 12 is driving more people to go to college uh, because we're not looking at the long-term impacts of education. We're looking at you know, whether it's standardized testing, 
where you just, you know, teach to the test, teach to the test, teach to the test. How, how does that encourage people to go to places that are necessary? So my question is, is how can we measure success in a way that actually meets the needs of the Commonwealth? Because I think ultimately that needs to be the goal, right? Is that we are, we are training kids in relevant industries so that they can have fruitful lives and prosper and do well within their communities. Um, because if you train somebody in something that's irrelevant, I don't care how well they do on a test, once they get into the workforce, they're not going to be adding any value and therefore they're not going to, they're going to struggle to uh, prosper within their own uh, fields. I guess my question is, uh, how do we measure success and, and how can we do that better? Because I, I think if we started measuring success better, that would direct educators to uh, train kids in things that are needed. So I'm curious what your thoughts are on that. Our, our most recent uh, state level conference for Pennsylvania Association of Career Technology used a statistic that was that 92% of students in career and technical education are gainfully placed, gainfully placed. And it stuck out because that's not the way that you hear the data measured often. And so when you dig a little deeper, what does gainfully placed mean? Gainfully placed means that they're in a career of their choosing. It means they're in a pathway of their choosing, the military. It means they're in post-secondary of their choosing two-year, four-year, trade school, whatever the case may be. And so I think if we can focus on students doing and following their passion and being able in five or seven or ten years, being able to have a, a family-sustaining income, I think that would be a metric that we could all lean into because it can mean different things for different folks. Uh, and so... I, I, was, I was intrigued by the way that that was represented, and I thought that it was a, a nice way to capture what we're talking about uh, relative to what the outcomes could be. You know, we've got 21 programs here, but that's not 21 jobs that are available to these students. That's 21,000 jobs that are available to these students. So many different pathways, like we've heard here, whether it's, um, as, as Mr. McCullough mentioned, or, or the, all the pathways. When, when Carla brings her HBA here for a job fair, it's incredible what the construction cluster encompasses. And just that moment where the students can see what's out there as an option, it's not just building a home, it's so much more than that. And our students get exposed to all of those different careers. So uh, hopefully that answers your question. Is that gainfully placed immediately after graduation or a year after or? That's immediately after graduation. So that would be a, a senior level survey. Yeah, and I'd like to start seeing us, to say, use certain types of metrics to, you know, make decisions. Uh, we're making on funding like that instead of the other more standardized things that I really don't think have worked. But all right. Thank you all very, very much for Yes. Yes, sir, Mr. Hickey. Uh, I just want to add that I you're judging the success of both education and CTE based on 18 and 19 year old kids you're not re you don't know if you're really a success or successful until you're an adult i would like to talk that every the all these kids when they're 30 are they productive members of society what are they doing are they have like dr covell said are they following the career that they initially chose in their lifetime dr sanko referenced that most kids when they graduate will go through like five or five jobs. Mr. McCall and I, we probably had two at most, maybe three if we were lucky, you know, it's, it's a whole different world. But the success of a student isn't when he's 19 years old. Like I always bring this analogy up, like you all do your rankings of how good we are, you know, as, as, in our state rankings as a, as a high school. And I always say this, I said, if every one of kids that graduated from Council Rock joined the military, you know what our state ranking would be as far as a high school would be? It'd be in the toilet. But yet, what a great service if every one of our students joined the military in some way, shape, or form. We should be, we should be here, not here. So you're trying to judge. I would say if I were you trying to look for some data, find out what these kids are doing when they're 25 years old. Find out what they're doing when they're 30 years old. Did they go to Did they go to college for a, 
to become a sociology major and now they're working in a, you know, in retail somewhere. Uh, I mean, certain jobs are, you need that education for. If you want to be in the health sciences, you want to be a doctor or something like that, you need to go to college, med school, whatever. And the same is with CTE. Like, you know, if you have a kid who went to tech school and became an electrician, is he still an electrician 30 years from now? He might be an electrician, but he might be like Mr. McCullough, who now owns his own business and is success. That's a success. You know, not just necessarily what you did when you're 18 years old. So if you want to try to find out data, I would try to find out data from your 30-year-old kids. Hey, what are you doing with your life now? You know, do you have a job? Do you have a career? Is your is what you're doing now what you thought you were going to be doing when you're 18 years old? Um, and, and how that translates as opposed to asking these kids who most of them, like I said, they don't really even know what they may want to do with their life, you know, specifically. They don't know at 18 years old. I mean, did, did any of you at 18 years old really know what you wanted to do? I mean, look at all you now. You are all in government. I'm sure when you were 18 years old, you didn't say, gee, I want to grow up. I'm going to be in government. No, you wanted to be lawyers or business person or doctors or whatever else you do with your life, you know? Does, does it make you a failure that you're sitting up here? No, I don't. Sure hope not, you know? But, uh... But like I said, use a role, you know, we're all adults and we're trying to f get information from kids. And kids today are a lot different from the kid that I was at 18 and Mr. McCullough because we're a lot older than you guys. It's a whole different world. The, the way that the kids are grown up now, I feel so, my kids are all grown. I'm sh you look a lot younger than I do. It, it's it's going to be a lot harder for you to raise your eight kids and put them through school or whatever that they want to do and get them on there than it was for me. And uh, like I said, kids today are not the same kids of 20 years ago. They need to be coddled more. You have these, you know, everybody has the cell phones that are working. The pandemic wrecked kids, and the effects of that is it's still going on, and it's going to take years and years and years to get these kids back to even where they were, let alone to where they need to be. So that's just my thoughts. Yeah, and, and I, I agree with your assessment on that looking in 10 years later, collecting the data and uh, is a little bit more of a challenge in that regard. But I, I do think that, that that ultimately would be the metric. All right. So for closing remarks, I'm going to hand it back over to Representative Marcel. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I wanted to just thank everyone for participating today. First of all, I wanted to thank the Policy Committee staff for setting this hearing up and being so helpful um, and for MBIT hosting us today. It was really nice to be back here. Um, and actually, before I finish the rest of my closing remarks, is there a tour that we might be able to take afterwards? Happy to walk around the building, okay. for sure. So if anyone would like to, I don't believe the entire building is available, but um, there are some special areas that um, MBIT is more than happy to show you around. It's a great facility. Um, so thank you to Mark, and thank you for taking us around uh, for the tour as well. I wanted to thank my committee members at the, for the policy committee and uh, all the members that came out here. I know sometimes it's really hard to make the time for these hearings, but I think that um, all of the testifiers provided really great ideas for us and great perspectives that we can take back to Harrisburg. Um, when we're there in September, I already have some bill ideas. I'm sure uh, my staff is, is not happy to hear that. But, um, you know, but I, I just really appreciate because hearing from the community, hearing from our districts, hearing from businesses, here we collectively all are trying to solve these problems together. And a lot of times it's hard to get to those solutions for policies without hearing from all of you. So I just wanted to thank you so much for your time today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Representative. It's always good to be in Bucks County. One of the things that I've always noticed when I come to Bucks County is that the representatives here, you guys all stick together and you all come and you support each other and you advocate together, which makes you a very, very effective block in Harrisburg to represent the interests uh, of, of you folks and others uh, in the region. So you're very fortunate to have these representatives here. Uh, and so thank you, Representative Marcel, for for being here, thank you to the testifiers. I thought this was very informative. I appreciate uh, the discussion. This is something that's ongoing, that uh, we will be working on these issues immediately and then also uh, long term. So your input uh, is, is very much appreciated. And uh, there's a lot of things that we're going to try and mimic uh, around the state. Uh, the policy committee will be having our next hearing in September 
which I, I know, I was like, September, that seems like a, I believe actually Vice Chairman Eckert will be uh, <laughs> managing that committee as well, so that hearing. So until next time, until our next policy hearing uh, in September, uh, this committee is adjourned.